Um, and I'm excited to kind of share a little bit about Teach for America today with you all and get the chance to hear from some people who aren't just myself because I am not the sole face of Teach for America by any means. So we're gonna start off with a quick welcome and overview about TFA. We're gonna have a really quick little three question alumni panel to hear from some voices that aren't me. Then you'll have a chance to go out into breakout rooms with our different alums, then we'll close out as a group. So starting off, who the heck is Teach for America and why the heck are you here? So first things first, Teach for America believes that we need to work to achieve equity across all sectors to better the lives of all individuals. Most people have seen an image like this at some point in their life where equality is giving everyone the same exact thing, but that's not actually what's necessary. If you were giving 18 people a step stool to see over this fence, that's not what everyone's going to need to see over it, but every person's going to actually need something different. Everyone gets the support that they need. Right now in America, there are 16 million kids who don't have access to a high quality education, pretty much because of the color of their skin and or the wealth of their families. Um, to me, that's really frustrating. That is not how the world is supposed to be, um, but it's how the world was designed. And people are like, the system's broken. No, the system's working exactly the way that it was built out to work. Um, and it's very frustrating, but that is why we exist to work to end this. So Teach for America is two years post-grad where you're a full-time, full salary educator working in a low-income classroom. We truly genuinely believe that one of the best ways to develop incredibly strong leaders is through developing leadership through teaching. Some people might be being like, I don't, I don't understand. When you are a teacher, you are in charge of everything. You are wearing every single hat. I was managing 210 students, like the size of a medium company, plus their 210 families, moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, brothers, sisters, everyone who cared about them, and being the janitor, the school nurse, the psychologist, the teacher, the principal, and all of the things all at once. When you have these experiences, you get so, so close to these issues of educational inequity and inequity across a variety of sectors. And that's part of my favorite part of our mission is it's not just, we're gonna have everyone stay in education forever, yay. Like, no, that's actually not what the main part of our mission is. Our goal is to actually have folks start their career in the classroom. If they choose to stay, awesome. About 60% of our core lasts for more than five years in the classroom because I can tell you, once you get started, it's hard to eventually leave. But we also have other folks take their experiences from the classroom into other sectors. So we have over 2,000 doctors who have done Teach for America. They are working to be aspiringly anti-racist doctors, which is something we very direly need in our community. We have over 4,000 lawyers, including we have one on this call. We have political activists and so on and so forth who have been doing amazing work because educational inequity is so inseparable from other types of inequities. So this is what our mission is, is we want to end this issue of educational inequity. So we start off by getting those really close relationships in the classroom and then building on that in our alumni network. So like I said, it is that developing the leadership through impact of actually teaching in a low income community. I learned more about housing, legality, uh, about immigration rights, about political advocacy and so much more just from working with third, fourth and fifth grade. But then we have our 62,000 member alumni network working to expand opportunity in every single sector. I oftentimes think about this quote from Brian Stevenson. If you haven't read the book, Just Mercy, you should. If you are bogged down with reading from school right now, you can also watch the movie. Uh, Brian Stevenson is a advocate against the death penalty. And he has this really profound quote of, we cannot make good decisions from a distance. If you are not proximate, you cannot change the world. For me in undergrad, I was part of different nonprofits. I was doing a bunch of volunteering, working in internships. I was convinced that I was so proximate to the issue, ready to solve everything. It's a whole different ballgame when you are talking to kiddos in your classroom, hearing about their own personal experiences and going from there. Um, for example, if you were to walk around East Harlem, where I taught, you would see massive issues of homelessness. And you might come up with a variety of reasons as to why these issues of homelessness exist. But by actually talking to community organizers and families and activists, you might learn that, for example, in New York City, they place every single one of the drug rehabilitation centers throughout the city of New York, all in this like same 10 block radius of East Harlem. The reason being, people in East Harlem don't have the money or the power to fight back against these things. So despite drug addiction being the same across the entire city, they have all of the drug rehab rehabilitation centers located specifically in East Harlem which increases likelihood of homelessness, which isn't okay, but you have to become so deeply proximate. It's not just like, 
a campaign stop or like stopping by for a few days. This is what happens when you live and grow in these communities. So again, like our awesome 62,000 alumni, we have 57 Forbes 30 under 30 winners. Um, this number of elected government officials is not updated as of the November election. So I'm pretty sure we've broken over 300 now, which is exciting. Um, over about 16,000 veteran educators, nearly 2,000 school and systems leaders. And for me, one of my favorite facts is that 80% of our alums still work in either education or directly uh, serving low income communities. That speaks a lot about the work that we do. Some people are like, oh, but TFA is just like two years and done. First of all, that concept is, cannot be further from the truth because this starts a lifetime of fighting against inequity going forward. So that's the overview about Teach for America, overview about the work that we do. I wanna kick it over to some of our awesome alums who are on the call to share a little bit about their experiences before we actually head out into breakout rooms. I am going to have you all go into breakout rooms after this, but we're just gonna hear three questions from each of our alums. Um, so we have Ashley, Allison, and Debbie on the call. Um, would you each mind going like order from left to right? This is teacher Shane talking. Um, order from left to right, giving a quick intro about who you are, maybe like 30 seconds. And Ashley, we can start with you. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Michelson. I was an LA 2013 core member. I see I have a fellow 2013 core member among me and I don't feel as old. Thank you for being here with me, Debbie. Um, I went to USC, I majored in business and I'm currently a math teacher at Innovate Schools. I teach in a, at a school down in Santa Ana. Amazing. Hi, my name Hi, I'm Ali. Um, I graduated from USC in 2015 with a degree in um, international relations, global business, um, served two years in Hawaii, and then um, now work at Facebook and recruiting. Hey, everyone. Um, sorry, my Zoom is acting up a little bit, but if you can hear me, just let me know. But yeah, I was a TFA Hawaii member, also 2013. Um, so I seem to share something in common with both Ashley and Allison, which is awesome. Uh, I ended up staying an extra year because I also love teaching. Um, and then I decided to leave and I just finished, I graduated from a joint um, JD, like law public policy program. And I went to public policy school talking about education policy. So that was my whole application. And I did a lot of education policy oriented work when I was in school. Amazing. I, I'm excited about this group of awesome individuals. One, because you can hear a little bit from some fellow Trojans here, but also hear about the diverse experiences that people have post TFA, right? Like working at Facebook, working in the public policy slash legal sector and working in education are all very different, but they are also truly interconnected. So I have a question for y'all. How did you ultimately decide to join Teach for America. You all studied business, studied IR, studied all of these different things. What was it that made you be like, yeah, maybe I should actually do Teach for America post that? Um, anyone can start, whoever comes off mute first. Um, I'll Go start. Go ahead, Ashley. Okay. Um, so I was a business major in college. So if you had asked me at the start of college if I would end up being a teacher, like I would be my eighth year of teaching, I would have thought you were absolutely crazy. Um, I was like the business major of all business majors. I got like all the internships and like lined up all the job offers. And I was like all about the networking. I went to every single networking event. Um, and I went to literally every single networking event. And then I had a friend in Helene's uh, who was a, who was getting recruited to Teach for America the year prior. And so she just encouraged me to go to an information session and I met this wonderful recruiter named London. I will never forget her. Um, and she just like really touched me with her stories from the classroom and with her experience. Um, and I just felt something really like compelling me toward that, where I said like, I need to ask more questions or I need to learn more. Oh, nice, <laughs> Debbie, that's so cool. Um, I just need to keep going to these information sessions. So I was going to all my business ones and then I was just going to TFA. That was like the only thing, not business. Um, and it just like really captured my heart and made me feel like it was, I didn't know what was going to happen after the two years, but I knew that it, it felt like a calling. Um, 
And then I didn't think when I got in that I'd stay for eight years, but here I am still absolutely love my job, love my kids and uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. Thank you for that. Ali, I think you were going next. Yeah, I think um, at USC, I kind of dove into a lot of opportunities that there were for volunteer work, which were super awesome, um, especially in the IR program I did teaching for, sorry, teaching international relations program um, in the South Central community. Um, I also tutored in the projects as well. I also did um, Spring Impact. Um, so a lot of different opportunities there that really kind of woke me up because I was coming from a place of enormous privilege and didn't really understand the depths of which educational inequity um, is part of our society and then affects people as um, they move through uh, their lives. So that really kind of lit the fire for me to work in Teach for America. Um, I had been thinking about going to law school when I graduated, that was really what I was set on. And um, a lot of people had given me the advice to not go directly from undergrad to law school or to graduate school. Um, so I decided to do Teach for America. I think Lyndon also did recruit me as well. Um, so yay, uh, she was awesome. And I also had a really good friend from USC Chamber Ballet Company who um, did Teach for America as well. And so she was telling me about her experience when I was kind of going through it and I was able to shadow her classroom and just seeing kind of the relationships that she was able to build with her students um, and the way that she was you know, actively working for an impact was pretty profound um, in terms of opening my eyes to that opportunity. Yeah, so I, I was also applying to law school. Uh, I remember sitting outside of Professor Rintalen's office, if you've had her uh, asking her for a recommendation letter. And uh, I, I didn't even wait until she came back. I just, I don't know, I got, a, I got an email from TFA Hawaii saying you should apply to Hawaii uh, when I was waiting for her, um, like just sitting on the ground. And I don't know, I, and that was also after I spoke to, spoken to London as well. So I think um, now I had about seven years to reflect on, on why I left. And I think it was because it, coming from first generation low income background and also coming from a Korean background, education was the most important thing. My parents uh, sacrificed a lot. And in Korea, actually they call teachers nation builders. It's the most coveted job. It's the most difficult job to have. You have to have top grades in college to even become a teacher. And I think for me, it, going to law school wasn't as meaningful and I was trying to find some purpose other than um, just going to grad school. So I, I think going to TFA was the best decision that I actually ever made um, in terms of my career and the growth I experienced. So um, if you guys have questions about grad school versus TFA, I, I'm definitely happy to talk to you about that. I, I know that was a big question that I had when I was in, a, in all of these prospect shoes, just being like, where do I go? What do I do? Um, so kind of building off of that, how did your experience with TFA actually play a role in the job you have now? Actually, it's kind of funny because like you're still teaching. So like hopefully there's some direct correlation, but also for Ali and Debbie, like figuring out starting and teaching and going to these other roles can be pretty overwhelming and like doesn't feel like the direct path. How, how do you still use the skills from your classroom in the current role that you have? So I'll start because I'm the most obvious and I like doing things in order. Um, I learned a few things during Teach for America that I currently use in my job every day. Um, I also think that, so I, I, spent, I spent five years at my original placement site. So I spent my first five years of teaching at the same place where I was recruited to go in Teach for America. And then this is my third year at a new school site. So one thing I would say is that just me being at um, the school that I was placed at for that long of a period of time really like gave me a clear sense of the type of school community that I would want to create or how I, like where I would want to go next, like what type of school I would want to be at next. Um, and really um, like transitioning between two different school sites has given me even like more clarity about like the types of schools I would wanna envision for the future. Um, I'm actually going to be having next year, I'm moving to France for a year because my partner got into business school. And so it's gonna be kind of like my eat, pray, love year where I just like 
sit around and like eat baguettes and drink wine and figure out what's going to happen in my life. But I think that this whole experience of teaching for eight years is really, um, yeah, Ashley in Paris. Um, it's really going to help me to like step back and reflect on where I want to take all of these skills in the future. And I can think of like a million ways that I could utilize the skills that I've learned over these eight years. Like there's so many different doors that I feel are open to me. Um, like I'm not just stuck in teaching. Um, so if I choose to go back to teaching after that year, that will be my choice. But I'll also, I know that I'll have so many options because of all the different skills that I've acquired. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Ashley. Um, I'll also say just a little plug, um, not really in the job that I have now, but I met my husband through Teach for America and we worked at the same school, got married. So um, just a little plug there in terms of big life change that happened from TFA. Um, but I think the biggest part for me, I work in recruiting now. So I work very closely with people and Teach for America made me, forced me to be very comfortable speaking with large groups of people, um, holding my own, not only with parents, but also, excuse me, not only with students, but a lot of parents were constantly kind of um, making comments about me being very young or looking very young. So just having to step into my own confidence and my own role. Um, and secondly, it really gave me a passion for DEI and um, diversity. And that's what I do a lot in, in Facebook right now is diversity recruiting. Um, there's an extreme dearth of certain uh, minority groups and underrepresented uh, groups in tech uh, in general and in specifically more engineering roles. And so I work on that a lot and trying to get um, what we call top of funnel to just get more people um, kind of seen at, by our hiring managers and more people in the door so that we can make a more equitable landscape and have more diversity of thought when it comes to large tech companies like Facebook. Um, so I can talk about policy school and then I'll talk about law school. So for policy school, I did a lot of education oriented work and uh, TFA actually has a lot of opportunities for policy work if you're interested because they have a sister organization called LEE, L-E-E. -E. I don't know if you've heard of that, but I got two education policy fellow internships fellowships through that organization. Um, now, also just by virtue of being in Teach for America, there are a lot of networks in Hawaii. So I was able to, I did, I did five internships and fellowships in education policy within three years. And that was just, and I could do it while teaching because they were part-time or during the summer. And it was again, because of the networks. And then for law school, I think what Ali was saying, um, you do speak every day. It is one of the few jobs where public speaking happens constantly, uh, but not only that, but you have to be really adaptive because you never know a student, students have lashed out at me in the classroom, it happens, or a student starts crying or, you know, it's like worst case scenarios, some of the students go through a lot and uh, you have to learn how to, you know, change your lesson plans or how to um, manage the classroom almost immediately. And I have to tell you, I have had nothing like that happen in graduate school or at my firm job right now. There's nothing that compares to that. Like people say law firm life is really difficult and it is, but like, you know, working with over a hundred or in Shane's situation, 200 kids every day, there's, it, it's the most complex and you need, you need a lot of skill to be really good at the job. So I actually do admire Ashley a lot for staying for eight years. Um, congratulations. Can you see my gray hairs? How are they looking today? I don't see anything. You look great. <laughs> Right. Looking fabulous. No, it is, it is a lot. And there are so many skills that you don't actually know that you're going to get out of teaching. You're like teaching, writing lesson plans and like hugging kids. And you're like, yeah, that's like a small part of the day, but it's also putting on all of those other hats and learning things. So that kind of brings me to the last question of what is one thing you've learned as an educator you didn't expect to learn? Um, it could be everything from me learning how to check for lice. That was one thing I learned how to do. Um, but also learning how to communicate across significant lines of difference. So anyone who has an idea of something you learned as an educator that you weren't expecting, you got to be experienced. Um, 
Looks like Ashley's thinking, so I can start this one. Um, I taught on a military base. So one thing that I learned is a lot about what it's like to be a military child in particular um, and, and the struggles and unique challenges that come with that type of lifestyle. Um, and just constantly being astounded on a day-to-day -day basis of the resilience and grit of the students that they were you know, constantly moving and traveling. They were dealing with a, per, a, a parent being overseas um, a lot of turmoil that went on in their young lives. Um, and I just learned a lot about military culture, um, the pride that they have, um, a lot about their rituals and, um, you know, lifestyle. So I think that was something that I wasn't really expecting going into it, but definitely changed the way that I see uh, that population for sure. That's great. Um, I'll go next. <laughs> I learned how to ask for help, which is, uh, I think, really fundamental in my current job at, um, again, I'm at a law firm, and it could get a little lonely because, you know, it's like, there aren't a lot of people who look like me at the firm, just in my practice area by nature, and you have to be resourceful and know who to ask for help, even if it's the administrative assistant or a partner or a mid-level associate, you have to know who to ask for, for particular things. And in school, like the administrative assistants at school are like the most crucial personnel. If you do end up teaching, please be nice to all the assistants and the staff. Like they are your crux, they know everything about the school. That was one of the most important things I learned is be nice to everybody. And everyone has a lot of value to give you and information. Um, and I still keep in contact with a lot of the assistants back in my school. So um, you could also get a lot of nice relationships out of that too. This is such a juicy question. Um, I've been really trying to rack my brain. So I'll start off by building off of Debbie's point about asking for help. What I would add on to that is um, usually I ask for help when I'm like processing failure and I really don't know like how to move past it or what to do next. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned that I didn't expect to learn is like how to process failure and keep critical hope when you feel like you're failing all the time. Um, like every day, right? Every day, like you're doing some things where you walk away and you're like, I kicked ass at that. And then the next thing you're like, that was a dumpster fire. Um, and so just learning how to like really process that and take it in stride and still think about all of those positives because we as a society are so attuned to like picking out little failures or picking out problems rather than looking at those bright spots. So that's actually something I'm still working on learning is like how to really keep critical hope and keep looking at the bright spots even when there's a lot of challenge in front of you. And then I would say the second thing that I learned as an educator that I didn't expect to learn, I'll say like I learned after my two years of TFA. So in my first two years of TFA, like I wouldn't say that I like had hope that like we could actually do equity. Like that image where there's like the kids that need the different step stools, like to see over the field. Like I didn't, I was like, we're making little chunks. We're like making process towards it, but like, I don't feel like we can do this. Um, and only in the last few years do I feel like I like really know how to do equity, like how to make equity happen um, in the classroom. And I feel like that is like such a transferable mindset that you can take to literally anywhere. Um, even when you're talking with parents, like how do you do equity for parents? Like some parents know a lot about the school process, some know a little bit, right? When you're talking to adults, like how do you do equity for a new teacher versus for an experienced teacher? Um, and I feel like that is such like a transferable mindset that I take into every conversation I'm in is like, how do I make sure that this is an equitable conversation and that everyone feels that they have what they need so they can walk away feeling confident? Absolutely. I love that. And I think, I think there are so many things that we learn and sorry for putting y'all on the spot, but y'all came up with awesome different ideas of the things that you really learned and gleaned and gathered. So now I'm sure uh, I'm not always the biggest fan of just like hearing people talk. I wanna be asking questions, getting to know people. So we're gonna head out into breakout groups. Um, 
I'm probably going to have us go into two different breakout rooms, like each 10 minutes long. So you get a chance to chat with different people. So in your breakout group, I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, you're going to quickly introduce yourselves. It'll be small five to uh, four to five people groups. Um, introducing the alum, we'll talk about how did you actually work alongside students and parents and communities while you were in the classroom, because that's a huge part. Parents ended up being like my lifesaver when I was in the classroom. Um, and then all of the folks on this call have opportunities to ask questions. So I find it very helpful personally. Um, sometimes I'm just like, okay, we're only gonna put you with whoever you wanna be in the same career sector as, but I actually think it's really impactful to hear from a variety of folks. So that's why we'll be spreading y'all out tonight. Um, we'll be coming back together in about 12 minutes, um, but I'll send you all out and give you all some reminders about when we're gonna be coming back. So I'll see you all in 12 minutes. Enjoy and have fun. Did you get a room, Debbie? You're all good. That's totally fine. It is exciting to see your faces. Please chat in. What is something you learned in your breakout room? What is one thing that you learned in your breakout room? Intersection of special education and law, definitely. That's a huge thing. Social side of TFA bonding. Yeah, own your own skill set and take it to the classroom. Exactly. Uh, don't know if y'all can tell. I'm a little bit extra silly. I'm really extroverted. I'd be like, work with my third graders dancing on top of tables. That is not how everyone needs to teach. Absolutely. Um, I love seeing what you all learned and gained from your breakout rooms. It is very difficult. Absolutely. Um, and they definitely honor your preferences, 100%. So quick reminder, first of all, make sure that you have filled out the link in the chat. That is how you'll be able to get some additional information from me afterwards. You're not going to be signed up for forever. I promise you that. Just fill it out so I have some contact info on you. But if you are a junior or a senior, you are actually now eligible to apply to Teach for America. Um, I know that there are a lot of options out there, as I'm sure you're probably exploring a ton of them. But if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the application process, we are hosting two different application workshops, one uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m., one the next day at 6 p.m. The application, honestly, for TFA is quite quick. It is your resume, easy peasy, and two short personal statements. Um, one is why are you interested in personal, or why are you interested in Teach for America? The other one is what is one of your most meaningful accomplishments? For seniors, the deadline's gonna sound a little scary. I'm telling you that in advance. We have one deadline coming up this Friday. We have another one coming up in March. I typically would say like, wait as long as you can, do your due diligence, do your digging. However, regions get tougher to get into the longer you wait. So by the time we hit our March 5th deadline, places like LA and the Bay Area and New York are closing down. If you're more open to more rural regions or places where you think people aren't preferencing it, they're number one, awesome, no worries. But if you're a senior and you're looking at some options and you're like, maybe I should be applying by this Friday, these application prep sessions will literally get you ready to submit by the end of them. So sign up for those if you so choose. Um, and also for the class of 2022, you have the option to apply by January 29th, this Friday, 
but the class of 2022 also has some other options, March 5th and April 9th. I personally applied as a junior. Um, the reason why I applied as a junior was one, I wanted that top choice of region, right? So like I wanted to go to New York City or I wanted to stay in LA. Those are my two places that I wanted to go. New York's my number one option, I got my number one. I also needed a little bit more time to decide if this is what I wanted to do. So I'm sure a lot of you are sitting here being like, I'm like down, I guess, but I'm not like certain that this is my career path. Exactly why I recommend applying as a junior. When I was a junior, I found out in May if I had gotten into Teach for America, and I actually got the choice to wait all the way until November to decide if I wanted to actually accept my offer. That is a six month time frame where I visited New York. I talked to alumni, I met more recruiters, I talked to way too many people, but I was then able to be certain. Senior year, you have about 10 days to decide if you want to accept an offer. That's scary. It's much easier when you have six months. Um, so juniors though, don't be stressed out by applying by this Friday. You don't have to, unless you're just super motivated and excited and you're like, oh my gosh, Shane, I have to do this with my life. Okay, fine, go for it, I don't mind. Um, you are more than welcome to come to the application prep sessions. Even if you're planning on applying all the way in April, it will just be a good support session. Um, oh, one last thing just about juniors is you can only apply once every academic year. So if you apply your junior year and let's say you don't get in, you actually can reapply your senior year and the interview questions don't change. I had um, a good number of people get in as juniors, but I also had some people obviously not get in because the application process and everyone who reapplied from their junior year in their senior year has gotten in, 100% of them. So consider this a way to just keep exploring Teach for America, keep exploring what you do. So it wouldn't be the end of a slideshow if I didn't have a fancy graphic to show you. So seniors, this Friday is gonna be your go-to deadline, 11.59 p.m. I know you can write 600 words before then, you probably have a resume done. Um, and juniors, you have all the way until April 9th. But I appreciate you all. I hope you have an excellent evening. I hope you're staying safe and healthy and I'll be talking to y'all soon. Thanks so much for being here. Bye y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank you. Yay. Cool. All right. We're just going to.